Hey everyone, my name is Alyssa Stone. I'm with The Crucible in Oakland. Thank you for joining us for our video presentation of our Fuego leaders from this summer. I'm so excited to welcome Leslie Kwok, one of our Fuego leaders and the incredible artist of this beautiful piece that you see behind me. Welcome, Leslie. Hi, I'm Leslie. I'm currently a junior in high school and I've been going to The Crucible for the past five years, um, but the past two years I've spent as a Fuego youth leader. I have experience in multiple mediums of art, so painting, drawing, musical instruments, but now I have shifted my focus to jewelry and metalsmithing. The Crucible is an Oakland-based industrial art studio with um, classes for people of all ages, and the youth program has been really special to me because it's one of the things that got me into industrial arts in the first place. It's a really great place for kids my age and kids of all ages to learn about different mediums and meet lots of really cool people. Many of the people I've met at the Crucible I've stayed in contact with for many years. For example, part of my time at the Crucible has been spent in the Fuego program and the mentors and teachers I've had there have really shaped me into the artist I am today. The other Fuegos in the program with me have become some really great friends and you're going to be lucky today to see some of their final presentations and my final presentation from the summer where we were able to demo in our respective disciplines. So first we're going to start with Alexandra in flame working, then we're going to move on to Max in the smithy, then Elisa has a really cool welding demo, I'll be in the jewelry studio, and then we're going to end with Lauren in leather working. And these demos were a final culmination of our time in the Fuego program this summer, and I really hope you enjoy them. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the last flame working studio at the Crucible. Now, if you come on in here, you'll see three sculptures that I've made over the years in chronological order. And these are essentially all birds. And I like working in birds when making things because I think that showing a sort of linear progression of how you sculpt things while keeping the same sort of um, topic while trying to find new ways to twist the ideas is very interesting and something that I think shows growth in how you do the art. So I'm going to talk about this piece first. This is a hummingbird and it was one of the very first pieces I made in glass flame work in the first week that I started. So a hummingbird is usually thought of as very fast and very um, energy and hectic, right? And that's exactly how I felt when making this piece because I was running around everywhere. And everything was going absolutely crazy. And not only that, but at the very last second, on the very last connection I had to undo, the whole piece came crashing down to the ground and everything fell apart. And so it was even more crazy when I had to put it all together super quickly. And actually you can sort of see that originally this was the foot of the hummingbird. And when it fell off, the hummingbird's foot got jettisoned from the body when I was trying to put it back together. And so they say hummingbirds actually can't move their feet. They can't walk. And I managed to move the foot of a hummingbird, showing that I can do the impossible less. You just have to figure out how to adapt to the situation. And so one thing about the piece is that I have to always worry about this thing called stress, not only for myself, but also in class. So stress in glass is caused, especially when the piece is sick, and when the piece has a whole ton of color on it. So one thing you'll notice is that there's actually quite a few cracks in the hummingbird. And that was caused because the wings are actually very thick compared to the body and I didn't keep enough heat on it. So that's something that I've learned and gotten better at. So um, this is my phoenix. And so for this one, I sort of decided to make a phoenix because I wanted to learn from my experiences a fiery rebirth of a bird in flame, right? And so for this piece, I actually planned it for him. In that way, it was better, but it was also worse because I ended up keeping too close to my plans and it ended up very complicated and crowded. And so the stress in this piece came mainly from having to put it all together at the end and worrying that it would fall all apart. And so you'll see here, the wings on this phoenix are actually made with many layers of glass. And I thought that was actually way too detailed. And I only realized at the end when I couldn't figure out how to balance the phoenix very well because the wings were just so bulky and it detracted too much of the piece. And then here, we'll look at my last piece. This is my piece for this year of the Fuego Club. Now these are meant to be two doves on two branches. Um, so I sort of went with a yin-yang lay motif 
with the colors where I had one white flower with black stamen and black flower and a black flower with white stamen. And doves are usually meant as a symbol of peace and yin and yang are meant to symbolize duality and peace. And I thought that in this time, it's something that we need to keep in mind. But not only that, with this piece, it was actually very unstressful. I managed to plan it beforehand while also being able to adapt to time constraints and any issues that we had. So in this piece, not only did we manage to get rid of a lot of the stress in the piece, it will not crack, but also it was a lot easier. And I think that's something I really enjoy uh, working with. And so you'll notice that the wings on this piece are very large, but some, they're very um, noticeable. But there's not a lot of color or a lot of things that would cause stress, right? Because the bigger it is and the more color, the more stress. And so I sort of went with a simple design that would be not stressful to do, make more to the piece. So I'm going to show you how I made my wedding system. So this is an oxygen broken torch. And this is how you make pieces in the flame oven. So turn it on. And I'm going to grab two of these rods and make that. And so this is how I made my wings. And one thing that was sort of interesting is that originally I planned to make the wings with these feathers, like you see now. But I actually attached them to a second piece where it would be coming out of. However, because I managed to have time to test it beforehand, I figured out that that design didn't work out very well. And it actually was very stressful on the piece to add so much um, glass onto one middle piece and then make that into base. So you see there how it's sort of bubbling? I'm going to actually take that part off because that inherent bubbles in the glass. And that can actually, like I've been saying, add stress to it. So I've been talking about how I like making my wings very prominent. And there's a few reasons for that. So one is just inherently, I think the idea of flight and freedom is very cool. And I've always been entranced by birds and how they look. And so that's sort of what I know about it also. But also, wings are a very good way to make your piece look more complicated while not adding a lot of stress to your piece. I keep bringing that up because it's the main um, component in trying to figure out how to um, plan your pieces when uh, making them in glass. So right here, what I'm doing is I'm heating up two rods of glass at the very tip. And so glass is essentially a fluid when it sits hot. So as long as you keep the heat on the tip, it will slowly form something called a gap, where it starts to ball up. Glass inherently loves to ball up into almost a perfect sphere because that's the way stress is shaped. There we go again. And so, in order to make the wings, I'm going to make two balls of glass, smash them, and then pull them into feathers. And so, what you'll see here is that if you used to see a bunch of orange on the flame, now you'll probably be able to see what's going on in the fire a lot better. And we glass workers we use these glasses in order to um, look at the flame directly because we're staring at this bright light for hours on end. So this will get rid of all the orange hue and make it so the glass looks sort of pinkish and also make it so the glass is a lot more visible. So I have about the right size in my right wing, but the left one is actually a little bit small. So I'm going to gather that a little bit more before finishing. Okay. So I'm going to set this down after falling it a little. If I set it down right now, it might block from the side because it's flat. So this is called a graphite pad, and essentially graphite poles do not um burn or they don't uh it's okay to put them in the fire and so it's okay to smash molten hot glass and that's exactly what i'm going to do so i essentially made a lollipop 
Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pull the block. In order to do that, I need to be able to hold it from both ends. So I'm going to do what's called a hot seal, where I keep both sides of the block, so it's basically a very nice seal in the block. And then I keep both sides of the lollipop so it's nice and lifted in order to pull. And there's different techniques, so I like starting to pull the swing and taking it out and folding. So this will be the top cover of my own. Now originally, I had it where I made three gathers, the three little feathers on my wing. But actually, if by accident or by a fortune, I accidentally cut one of these feathers in half, well, in two thirds and one third, while making one of the wings. And I figured out that actually gives it perfect proportions to what I wanted. So I kept that for every single wing that I made. And it's little, Mm, things that you stumble upon like that that make it so all planning that you made beforehand gets thrown out the window usually but as long as you know generally what you're doing and you can adapt your plan things will end up okay and that's one of my favorite things about this because this class you're not the one who's reading this class will lead you on a slow molten very very viscous journey and you just have to follow it too so I'm gonna smash this now. And we have a second roll of Once again, I'm gonna hot seal, getting both of them very long. Nothing in the file. And then I'm gonna keep both ends of the wall in order to stretch it. So this time I'm actually going to pull this into two pieces. So I'm feeding the middle again. So I can pull it right there. So this will be my center and this will be the bottom. So I'm actually going to tap it right now. You'll notice it started to block. That was actually my bad. I pulled it a little too thin. That should be okay as long as I do it. So you notice up here it's starting to block a little, so I'm actually going to pull that off here and just hold it by this. Now I'm going to attach the top one. Once again, I keep both parts that I want to attach together. Wait till it's nice and warm. Tap it in the file. Pull. And then I'm going to cut this part off. Actually, no, I'm going to cut this part off. And then you'll notice. That at the end of each of these very thin wings is sort of a ball shape. And that's what I was saying. When you feed a glass, it likes to ball up like that. And so, in order to get rid of that, you could either use tweezers, use that in the fire, and pull. And so, it has a much thinner end. Or you can use another piece of glass. And so this is where I would be, right here, to attach it to the bird, and then I would cut it off here, and that's why I made all the wings on my bird this year. Thank you for listening. Hey, I'm Max. This is the Smithy. 
Um, so yeah, I'm a I'm a ten year Fuego blacksmithing intern. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, music. It's great. I love music. Um, okay. So pretty much we're going to talk about my projects that I did this year and last year. Um, this was the project I did last year. I wasn't exactly sure how to incorporate music into blacksmithing. That's just like, music's my, like, my biggest inspiration. I just love it. Um, so I decided to make, you know, a bar of music. Uh, Max, could you tell us a little bit about the materials you used for your project? Um, well, okay. I actually used uh, railroad spikes to, uh, to make the notes, um, which took a really long time, actually. Um, it required a lot of hammering. Uh, it took a lot of time. Um, and then I used rebar for the, um, the staff. Um, and then uh, I used sheet metal uh, for uh, that I cut out for the rest notes. Um, what does this line of where does this line of sheet music come from? Uh, this song this uh, is from the song of the blacksmith. Um, I thought it would be funny if I um it's uh, it's a song I really like. We played it in band when I used to do band to start the year. Um, and uh, I don't know. I thought it would be really funny if I you know yeah it's totally funny. If I made it into the, the first line. A double meaning to the piece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Would you like to show us another piece or would you like to play us some music? I mean, okay, just real quick. Yeah. We have my wind chime. I made this this year. Uh, I had no idea how else I would incorporate music into blacksmithing. Um, so I thought, you know, I was thinking about it and we used to have a lot of wind chimes back at my old house when I was younger. Um, so I thought I'd make a wind chime with little leaves because I really like doing leaves and it's pretty. What were the materials that you used for this beautiful piece? Um, I used spoon stock, which is just uh, like mild steel, I think. Or, and then also brass that I got from jewelry. And then also leather, which I got from other working and then woodworking and then I made a little hook at the top. A truly collaborative piece. Yep. Okay, well, that's kind of it. Um, I mean, since the forges are off, I can't really like do a demo. So we're just gonna like play some new music, you know? Because oh, Max, before you jump into your beautiful song, we have a request to actually play the wind chimes. Could we hear what the wind chimes sound like? Yeah, sure. They don't clink around very good, but. Subtle and lovely. Yeah. All right. Well, I, for one, am extremely excited to hear your wonderful music, another incredible part of you as an artist. Max, what's the song you're about to play for us? Um, I'm going to play Ain't No Sunshine When She's Gone. Uh, I forgot the original song for some reason. Uh, anyway, um, I like the song. It was the first song I ever learned because it's really easy. It's like you do this with like two, three, like that, and you do that. And that's the entire song. But it, 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 you move around up and down the fretboard. But, um, okay. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. Oh, wait, did I string the wrong key? Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. It's not warm when she's away. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. This house just ain't no home. Anytime she goes away. Wonder this time where she's gone. Wonder if she's gonna stay. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. This house just ain't no home. Anytime she goes away. I know, 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 I know. Hey, I'll leave the young thing alone. 
ain't no sunshine when she's gone. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. Only darkness every day. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. This house ain't no home. Anytime she goes away. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Max. Yeah. Why is that song important for you? Um. Well, uh, it was the first song I learned, right? It was really easy and simple. But I also just love the way the song sounds. It's like a, it's a blues. It's like a, it's, okay. So it's a different take on a blues song, right? It's, it has like the blues progression, and the sounds, and the chords. And it has this, which I love. Um, and it's probably the first song, blues song I ever listened to without knowing it was a blues song, which is kind of like my passion now. I really love blues. Um, so yeah, I don't know. And it's also, I don't know, it's just so pretty. Uh, yeah, I have a I have another song that I can show you. It's a it's another blues song actually. It's a one I learned a little more recently. Um, it's a little more complicated. What's this song? Uh, Nobody knows you when you're down and out, and this is played by many different people. I really like the Scrapper Blackwell version. I cannot play as good as him, so I'm just gonna we're just gonna okay we're just gonna go with it okay. <laughs> comments in our chat this evening before we head out i have one more question what is your favorite part of the smithy um my favorite part of the smithy um oh we have a music system it's so nice we have speakers and i can plug in my phone and we and i can play whatever i want it's really great oh it's so nice it's so nice i love it 
you know, there is something very rhythmic about, you know, being in the smithy. So music and blacksmithing certainly go hand in hand. Yeah. Well, thank you, Max, for being such an amazing Fuego leader these last couple years. We are so excited that you have shared with us your gift of art and music this evening. So we're going to say a big virtual thank you to Max, and we're going to head off. Right, we are going to head off. Hi, I'm Melissa McCormick, and I am 17, and this is my second year in the Fuego program. Now, for my demo, I'm going to be creating a small and quick project, so please leave your suggestions in the comments. It can be anything like animals or some innate object that you want me to see or that you want me to see weld out of some scrap metal. So, Elisa, are you asking our audience to tell us what they want you to make? Yes, I am. I want to hear what your suggestions are, and I want to make one of your real comments, not a pickle. Because um, that got suggested to me a couple times. Now, this is my second year in the Fuego program, and I want to take you to look at some of the previous projects that I've made. So, when I first started out, I had to take a prereq class. And these are two of the projects that I made. I have this hedgehog right here. And up here, I have a turtle. Now, if you look real closely in here, you can see that these are the same pieces just replicated over and over and over again. And those same pieces are used up here in the turtle. Now, a lot of times when I make art, especially if I already know what I'm going to make, I tend to think about how can I break this down and how can I remake this out of components that repeat over and over and over again, which is why you see so many of the repeating parts. So for example, with the turtle, I was like, okay, I want to use these repeating parts. So I used that in the shell, and I was like, okay, now that I have a shell, what can I do that will really make this look like a turtle? And so we have this head right here, which has like a slight mouth um, kind of thing. And if we flip it over, last year they had a bunch of railroad spikes, like right here, right here, and here. And I thought those would make some super cute little feet, along with this piece right here, which makes a tail. So now you can obviously tell it's a turtle. Now, I started Fuego, right? And so first thing I thought of was like, I thought about doing a bigger turtle or doing some other things. But then when it really came down to it, I had finally learned how to draw chains that year. And so I'm drawing these chains, and I ended up drawing this chain uh, bird on like, it was originally like a plaque. And so Nico walks over and he's like, that's so morbid. I didn't realize you were that morbid. I thought you were a happy, spunk kind of person. And this is where the second part of my art comes in. I like doing things out of spite or just doing things that seem impossible. So because Nico told me that it was too morbid for what my personality should be, I was like, that is what I'm going to make. So you start here on the bottom. It's an incredibly heavy piece. So we had to get a bunch of big casters that would allow it to move around easily. And so this ball right here, you see these little tabs that are bent and misshapen. Um, although they look normal on the top, the bottom side of them is actually practice welds. These are the pieces of metal that we use when teaching kids how to weld. And on the underside, there's all these like, scratch marks and dent marks, but I figured I'd reuse them and turn them into something cool, which is actually going to play into something important higher up. Now, we have this thick chain here, and I got it as a galvanized chain, so when I was welding it, it let off zinc fumes. And so... I actually got zinc poisoning from doing this project. Not a fun experience, but the end result I think is worth it. If we move up, we see these pieces of rebar bent and curved. This is one of the first pieces I actually had to plan out. So I have a life-size drawing of all these pieces of rebar, which I used to measure out how long I needed to cut them. And so, if we continue even further up, we get into these wings here. And here's where I was talking about where it's a lot of recycled material. These pieces here are actually what I have holding in my hand. This is an electrode, and we use it to weld. It's what allows us to add metal to our thing. And when you start to learn how to weld, you tend to burn them up very fast, and you leave with these very long pieces. Um, so usually they're coated in a layer, like on this, for example. And so I spent a good day or two just spending hours hitting off this slag of the burned ones. That way I could reuse it and weld them each individually on here to create a wing pattern. Now, this was last year. This time I had to go even bigger and even better. So we make something about a foot taller, naturally. 
Now, I'm a huge coffee drinker, and I know a bunch of people who also are. And I was like, what can I, what can I do that is coffee? And so I was talking to a friend, and they were like, giant French press. And I'm like, brilliant, exactly. And that's what I mean by bigger and then. So, this was originally a French press. It had to have a stable base. There's actually, if you get real down in there, there is a pump down there that allows you to pump up the proposed coffee through the tubes that run all the way up to the top and out the dragon's head. Now, as we're going up, you see these pieces right here? These are the old gears that I found um, at Cass, and I'll get back to them later because they are an amazing partner to work with. So I spent a good hour or so cutting these in half and welding them in a certain pattern so they would link together. And again, I love reusing materials and finding materials that repeat easily. So having these to be scales was super useful. It curves all the way up at the top here, and it comes out of the mouth. And the head is actually one of the coolest pieces on here. Because if you really get up here, you can see all of these handles and knives are actually old silverware that I found and cut up into certain pieces. And again, we have these electrode bits showing another reuse thing. And something else that I added when working on Dragon and like other things like this is if you look right here on the side, that is a pattern weld. It is not a structural weld. It is a weld to add metal and a cool texture. And one other cool thing this did is the head will swivel so you can swivel it out here and get your coffee. Now, as you can see, it's not full of coffee today. And that's because cleaning out coffee is a pain, especially if you're going to turn it into a fish tank. So as soon as I get it home, we're going to find some nice angel fish to be swimming around in the circles in here. Now, I talked about um, how I like going bigger and better. And naturally, that comes with competition. So I started off by making this small little paper clip. I mean, not necessarily small, but small enough. And so my friend decided to one-up me by making a paper clip about yay big out of one-inch bar stock. Now, naturally, that was not okay by my terms. Thus. The five and a half foot paper clip made out of chain and welded individually at each point. It has a little bit of flexibility in it because it is chain and because it is such a large piece. Um, but you can clip paper if you find one big enough, of course. Um, yeah. Now, this is the first time um, being a Fuego that I actually got to work with a partner. I got to work at a place called Cass. Shout out to Cass, they were amazing. I really enjoyed working with them. And so I commissioned a piece for them, which is this giant butterfly. Now, I use a lot of reuse materials, and 90% of these materials are materials I actually got from Cass. I went there a total of three times and took half a ton of steel, which is pretty impressive. So when I was starting this, Cass told me that they wanted something that they could hang on a wall. And they wanted uh, something, the theme of reuse of materials. So I found a bunch of these materials that you would recognize. For example, the springs over here, these larger discs, which are in cars, more of these, and a bunch of gears like you see over here. Even a pair of tongs that you would use for cooking. And so I was like, what's something that's patterned and flat? Of course, a butterfly. So I started out with a basic layout of the design, and I showed them a concept picture, and I got approved. And so I laid it all out, and I realized that I needed something a little bit more stable to really show the design of the butterfly, which is where these pieces come in, and they outline it, and they make it so everything can be filled in in a space. Now, if we come around this way, I also decided to make a miniature butterfly, complete with a card holder, because I figured the other butterfly might be a little too big for a tabletop. Now, uh, I'm going to show you guys how to weld something. Uh, you have a hood right over there that you should put on. And I'm going to go turn on the welder and vent hood. I'll be back in just a second. As both Lisa and I get hooded up, I'll try to put the hood over the camera. And I'll just look away. Good idea, Lisa. Good idea. We have some safety equipment that's super important when welding. We have our hood, which is going to protect us from the sunlight UV rays that come off of the uh, light when you're welding. We also have a jacket, which is super important because there are UV rays you can get sunburned. There are also a lot of sparks that fly out everywhere. Let's just get this on. 
you want it all the way buckled up because you never know where a spark's gonna fly. It's the same reason why you want to wear long pants with high boots because otherwise the spark can fall into your ankle or into your foot where your shoe is and it'll continue to burn your foot and it's very uncomfortable. I've had the experience before. Yeah. Finally, what's well, super important, we do actually a little test with these, is we put them on to make sure you have enough dexterity for your fingers that you can do things, but because these gloves do heat up when you touch something on, you want to be able to shake it off real fast, that way your hands don't get burned. Now, uh, I'm going to give you a short, or a short explanation of what I'm going to do here. Uh, a welder is just a shorted out battery that creates a lot of heat in one area, allowing you to fuse metal to metal or even two pieces of metal to each other. So we have to create a circuit. Thus, we have our ground plan right here, meaning this entire table is lined. But don't worry, you'll be okay because you're not touching the top end. The top end is right here. This is what we call our stand. Now, the rope of this can be awfully heavy and stressful on your arm, so you always want to have it over your shoulder. There's a little clamp right here, which you'll see the inside of it, which may be kind of hard to see, is uh, metal and it's conductive. So if you were to put it on here, you'd expect it to spark. But no, we have these ceramic plates, so that way you can leave it down and work on your other things. But we have these, which are electrodes. The inside of them is metal, allowing you to conduct electricity through your, through your rod, into your piece, through the table, and back, creating a full circuit. Now, what am I going to try and make today? We got one suggestion for a cat. A cat? Cool. So, I'm going to start my design project. There's a few things that constitute what a cat is. Thus, we need to figure out what this one I have these smaller pieces oh, wait, here. Oh, wait. Well, do you want an option? I can do a cat. Oh, sorry. There was a cat or a dragon part. And a sea otter. And a sea otter. I vote cat. You vote cat? I'm going to do cat mainly because I have a lot of pieces that will work really well for a cat. Yay! So we need to come up with some basic components that we can tell easily are a cat. So we need something that can be the head, and we need something that speaks ears really easily. So I have these two pieces here. We can put them on the sides and make a little head. And we also want to find a body. Let's see. We can do a triangle piece body and we'll just place it like so. And so we need to have little paws at the top and little feet for the bottom. So that should be enough pieces. Ah yes, one other thing, it needs to have a tail. And that's kind of how my creative process goes. I look at my materials and I see what I have and what can I do with them. Now, let's start. Getting on the glove for safety. I'm going to start with the head. I'm going to use two pieces to help stabilize it where I would like to. And I'm going to place the ears on it real quick. I'm going to grab a pair of pliers because this is a very small one. And I don't have enough dexterity in my fingers to actually hold it with my hands. Elisa has, like I said, been one of our most prolific wiggles. They all make so many extraordinary projects. Elisa is able to pump out at least two or three in a day, which is a feat to say the least. Okay. Now, one important thing to keep in mind, especially when you're welding around other people, whenever somebody says cover, that means they're about to start welding. So when I say cover, I want you to pull it down your foot to keep your eyes safe from being sunburned or hurt. If it does happen, you should be okay. It's just like glancing out the sun for just a second. Now, I have my rods here. I'm going to place a rod in my stinger, which is my constant. I don't want that to come the table. I'm going to grab my pliers. And what do you think? Outside like that? Does that make it look like a cat? Cool. Now, I want you to cover. I have to start the well. Thank you. 
the side. We grab our secondary gear. Now we want to make sure these are kind of going in the same direction. So we will grab these with our pliers. Let's see, it's going kind of like that. Both the ears to kind of go out. So I will weld this like so, so that we start creating our little top face. and 
have that final snap. Pause. Same procedure. Take it up. <laughs> Place it where I'd like to. Right there, we have our middle half in 10 minutes. Incredible work, Elisa. Thank you so much for sharing your amazing demo with your welding. How long have you been welding at the Crucible? I have been welding since roughly seventh grade, and this is actually the first class I took here at the Crucible. And ever since I took it, I've fallen in love with the art. We are so grateful that you have shown us a live welding demo as part of our Fuego 2020 reception this evening. Let's give a wonderful bravo to Elisa McCormick as we say ta-ta for now and head off to our next Fuego leader. Bye. Hi, I'm Leslie and welcome to the Jewelry Studio. Um, so just for y'all today, I have kind of some of my work throughout the ages from like my five years being here. Um, and also I'm gonna do a quick little demo on how I make some of my pieces. Um, so if you look over here, these are some of the first rings I ever made. And actually this one right here is the first ring I ever made at the Crucible. Um, so this is like a really special piece to me because clearly you can see there's a lot going on with it it's definitely not my best work but for me it's kind of like one of the first pieces i made at the crucible and one of the first pieces that really got me into jewelry and kind of made me so passionate about the work that i do here um so honestly um all of these rings you can kind of like see my progression of work there's a lot of improvement in just like refining it and getting soldering and so these just kind of like are the first steps that I took this one being my most recent ring and it's also a really special piece to me because this is actually my friend Elisa's ring who you just met and these are rings they're in a matching set and I made rings for every single person in our program last year so we all have matching mementos of last year what is the material of some of these beautiful rings um the one that I made for the Fuegos they're all sterling silver but all of these ones are nickel and silver as well as one made up from copper and then speaking of copper, this is a piece that I know um, if some of you have like information on the crystal, you may have seen this piece mm -hmm. on the website. Um, this is a butterfly crown that I made out of copper last year. And definitely it's my first really big piece that I ever made. And it's also really important to me because it kind of inspired me to make bigger scale pieces and kind of showed me that I can do more than I thought originally. Um, and then kind of speaking of crowns, moving on to the pieces that I made this year. This year, compared to the one piece I made last year, I kind of went a little bit crazy. Um, so this year I made kind of a three-piece set as well as some earrings to go with it. The first object I made is this crown and it's made out of sterling silver and bronze. Um, this crown is, oh my god, um, it took me <laughs> probably a week to make and it's kind of my pride and joy right now. There was definitely a lot of ups and downs in making it. I know just this morning we had an incident where a piece melted and another piece got lost, um, which was definitely hard to deal with, but I think it just helped me a lot with persistence and obviously a lot with my soldering skills, which I couldn't have done without my mentor, Ricky. Um, the second piece in this set is a face mask that I made. And obviously this mask is just for decoration. It is definitely not to be used as protection. Um, but this mask for me is just kind of my twist on the mask that we've been having to wear because of the pandemic. And it's kind of my way of putting my own little fun spin on something that's become such a staple in our lives. Um, and then finally, I have my last piece, which is a matching set of, I guess, sort of glasses frames to go with it. And this for me was just a really fun piece to make. Um, I was inspired by something I saw online and kind of just wanted to make a third piece to tie in the rest of my 
work this year. So Leslie, all of these stars you hand fabricated. Um, yeah, so all of the stars on the crown were hand cut and soldered, as well as the ones on the glasses. And then for the mask, all of the stars were handmade, and I'll be showing you how to make those later. Cannot wait to see how you create these gorgeous stars. Um, and then along with the stars on the rest, I had some free time while I was waiting for pieces to finish cleaning and for them to cool. So I made this set of earrings. Um, and then this one, the hearts are actually, I made for a friend of mine, as well as these two sets of star earrings that I just made to kind of get some more practice with making the stars for the mask. Um, so speaking of stars, if you follow me, I will be doing a really fast demo on how I actually make them. Um, so this is a bench, and we use these benches for kind of everything. A lot of cutting, a lot of polishing, and yeah, we kind of just do everything here. Um, um, so this is sterling silver wire, and typically in the jewelry studio we use either sterling silver or fine silver. Um, the difference between them is basically sterling silver has extra stuff added in, and that kind of allows it to be a little bit stronger, which I liked for using my stars just because they're kind of thin and delicate. Um, so I have the sterling silver wire, and I also have this pair of pliers. And if you can see, these pliers have a little V-shape, and they allow me to shape the points for the stars. So what we're gonna start doing is we're gonna take the wire and we're gonna put it in between the pliers. And this is just gonna allow us, oops, to pinch it up into a V. And then we're gonna flip it upside down to get the other point. Gosh. And that's gonna give us the other point of the star. And then we can keep doing it along the wire. And basically, the way that I've constructed these stars is by kind of creating the entire outline in a straight line and then gradually adjusting the, each of the points on it so that it forms kind of the star. Um, so we're going to need five of the points to obviously make our star. Okay, so here are the first five, and then we're going to do one more just so we can join it up. And then we're gonna use our wire cutters, and these are special wire cutters, and they're typically used in making chain and jump rings. And they're just special because unlike some of our other wire cutters, they have a flat point. So it makes it a lot easier later in the process. So you can just cut it off. And then after that, we're gonna take a second pair of pliers. And these pliers are just gonna allow us to bend the points of the stars to fully form the shape. And we're gonna want all of the points that are gonna go out to be a lot smaller and all the points that are going in to be a lot bigger. And typically for silver, just because it's a very thin gauge wire, gauge is how we measure um, the thickness of wire. Um, typically for silver, you don't have to do what we call annealing. And annealing is a process in which you heat metal with a torch and you're gonna get it to a certain temperature. And this is gonna allow kind of the metal to loosen up, which allows it to be more easily worked with. And we do it for a lot of our bigger pieces. So when I was working with my crown, I worked on it for the headband. Um, and I used it a lot last year for the texturing of my butterflies. Um, but since this is such a thin and soft wire, we don't have to do that. So as you can see, we kind of have this little star formed. Um, and then obviously there's a little bit of extra, so we're just gonna take the wire cutters and cut that off, so then you have a star. And then the next step of the process is gonna be what we call soldering, and I have another star that's already prepped for that. So you just follow me. Um, so basically soldering is a process in which we take this metal and we basically melt it on to another piece of metal and it allows us to join things together and we use it, oh my God, I use it all the time. You basically use it whenever you want to connect things or close it off or just make something stronger. Um, and this is a special type of solder, it's paste solder. Typically solder can come in many forms. One of them is just like a regular stick. And obviously if any of you have any like electrical engineering or computer science background, you may have used solder with soldering circuits. Um, this is slightly different, I'm gonna, quickly tie up my hair and put on some glasses because safety first. Um, 
Um, so this is one of our torches. We used to have oxygen propane torches, but we recently switched to these really nice ones that only have one source of fuel. So I'm just gonna quickly light it. These are acetylene torches that Leslie is using in our jewelry department. Um, and before I actually start soldering, we're gonna do a little bit of prep first. And as you can see, I have this star right here that I've already filed and prepped. But what I'm gonna do is I'm going to paint on some of this liquid in here. Um, this liquid is basically, um, it's a mix of alcohol and borax, and we basically use it to keep our metal clean and to kind of like protect it from any outside things that may get on it and prevent us from getting a clean solder. Um, so now what we can do is start heating up the metal. And kind of the key for this is to get the right amount of heat on your metal so that you don't melt it, but you can still melt the solder. And obviously silver is gonna melt at a higher temperature than this solder. So we just have to be a little bit careful about it. And right here is where I'm gonna put on the solder to seal the joint. So I'm just gonna quickly dab on some of this paste solder. And then you can just start heating it up. And the important thing is to come at it from all sides because there are kind of a lot of conditions for, there's some conditions for soldering that you have to keep in mind when you're actually doing it so that you can get a clean connection. And one of the first things is solder really likes to flow where there's a lot of heat. So you wanna keep a lot of heat on the joint. And also, like I said earlier, we keep it clean because solder likes going into clean, tight spaces. And as you can see, it's going to start heating up and eventually it's gonna to start to get this kind of shimmery little look, and that's when we know it's soldered. So once, I'm gonna put a little bit more solder, just to make sure I get a strong connection. And then you can see that that solder just flowed, so we can turn off our torch, and then take it off. And because this is now really hot because of the torch, we're just gonna put it in some water to quench it, and then we have a fully connected star that can be then used for earrings or a mask or a pendant or whatever you want to put it on. What an incredible demonstration, Leslie. I know I'm first on your commission list for a pair of those beautiful star earrings. Thank you so much. What is your favorite material to work in, Leslie? Um, personally, this year I've been working a lot in silver and fine, um, sterling silver and fine silver. Um, so probably one of those, just because each material has definitely pros and cons for working with it. Um, silver itself is a little bit more finicky, so it melts at a lower temperature than the rest. And there's a lot of things that we have to do to keep it clean and to keep the right color. Um, last year I worked a lot on copper, which is a pretty easy metal to work with. And it's one thing that we teach a lot of the campers here to work with first. Um, there's also kind of like bronze and brass, but those metals along with nickel tend to be a little bit tougher to work with just because they have different heating up points and um, just kind of like different things that you have to keep in mind for working with it and making sure that it's pliable enough to actually texture it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Warren Marlett and I'm second year Fuego. Uh, obviously in London work, I mean, you already said that. But this year, well, no, I should say that for last. <laughs> I've been I've been doing leather working for I guess five years, including this year. And this was the first. No, I made a card case first. That's a demo everybody has to do. It's a card case. So this is the first, like piece that I made, which is Majora's Mask from the game, the video game, Legend of Zelda, Majora's Mask. Uh, I really like the design. I actually took leather working specifically because I wanted to make Majora's Mask and it seemed like the most feasible medium to do it in. And I like leather working a lot because like 
it's way less hazardous than the other ones. So you have more freedom doing what you want. And it was like more similar to mediums I'd done previously. So I continued taking it. And this is the second year one. And it was obviously more complex than this. I was still trying to figure out like patterns and stuff. So the proportions are kind of whack, I think. And I did more experimenting with tooling. Tell us what tooling is, Lauren. Oh, yeah. Um, so tooling is basically when you texture the leather. So you can use just stamps, which I will show you how to do. Or you can use a, it's called a swivel knife. It's basically like a little knife on a swivel. And you carve lines into it. And then you use like special stamps to like emphasize the lines. So I did that a lot in here. You can see it well in the lines on the side. And I also tried a bit more water forming, which is when you get the leather really wet and then it's like bendable, it's like plastic. So you can bend it and then once it dries, it'll stay like that. So that's how I made all the spikes on these two. And then the third year I made this mask, the Killmonger mask from Black Panther. There's so I'm really proud of this one's forms specifically, just like how structural they are, and like I'm surprised they stay up nice. But then if you've seen Black Panther and you know the King Marvel mask, it has this mane, which I couldn't do at the crucible. So when I got home, I made the thing that keeps it on the head out of an old belt, and I made the mane out of the bloom. <laughs> or two, but you know. An incredible reuse of materials. It does shed a little bit though when you wear it, so you have to be prepared for that. And then I did, oh, there's a part, yeah. I did Fuego, so <laughs> that was the first time the Crucible did like a month long program, so we had four weeks to make stuff, and I planned on making this bag and actually made two of them. This was kind of busted, it was in storage and it lost uh, one of the rivets that my mentor, Ricky, made. So it'll just like pop open if I remove this. But I plan to make it as bag. I copied the design from Killy Design on Etsy. If you want a bag like this that actually works and looks better, you should buy it from them. But I was inspired by that design. I thought it was really interesting how it like, I don't, there's probably a word for that, but the way it opens and it like segments, it's not just for decoration. I also thought it looked a lot like bugs. So two of these bags and uh, Ricky Smelser, who is the jewelry mentor and other working mentor, uh, made these three centimeter long rivets and I got to learn how to like hammer the rivets that are pre-made and that was pretty cool, but I was bored of making those. So I just made a ton of bugs because I was kind of inspired by this when I was looking at a lot of bugs and these ones are kind of scrappy. I, I, they're pretty unfinished. I don't want to sew all that stuff. To, to me, sewing is kind of tedious. <laughs> but I had fun dyeing all these. I had like the different ways I dyed them was like interesting to me. Tell us about your dyeing process. Are there different dyes that, that create these gorgeous color shades? Yes. Yeah, so the dye we have at the Crucible is water-based. So you can kind of use it like watercolor. Uh, there's other types of like leather coloring stuff, like there's leather paint, which I have at home, but I didn't use on these. But yeah, so we have water-based dye and you kind of just like put it on like a cotton swab, big one, not a Q-tip. <laughs> but I experimented with that stuff and like splattering and all that. And I'm pretty happy with the colors, but they're really unstable. And I kind of only had myself to blame for that because I didn't feel like sewing. But <laughs> after this year, if we go, we had half the time for this year's. But I made this fish bag, which has so, like more sewing than I've done in like anything combined. Like all my previous stuff combined is, I used up like, I finished up like two spools. And oh my God. That was a complication because I ran out of one color and I had to use another. But this fish bag, I, I also was inspired by someone else. Uh, 
I don't know the real name, but it's from Atelier Iwakari. And they make these custom fish bags. And I saw them a long time ago. And I thought they were super dope. And I wanted to make one, but I knew back then I was definitely not skilled enough. But I thought this year I was. So, <laughs> yeah, I like found a pattern for it. I figured out the pattern. I had to, like, it was like a puzzle. And instead of individually cutting out 350 scales like they do, uh, I did a scallop strip, which saved me so much time. Tell us about your process yeah. of unfurling another pattern to okay. create this beautiful fish bag. So for the pill bug bag, I had to kind of just like eyeball pictures of it and then make a pattern. But this one, they have a blog where they post all their stuff and each bag is different. So there's like multiple pictures of all the pieces laid out. And I kind of had to, well, my dad works at like an engineering place that has one of those huge printers. So we scaled up from this one of the scales because they have the measurements for the scales. But I scaled up the whole picture just based on the scale and got the life size pattern. And that was printed out and I cut it out and then I had to figure out what everything goes. Like the body pieces were really confusing. They kind of just like look like oblong shapes. It's hard to figure out where everything goes and like let alone how to sew it and all that stuff. It took, I did that like a week beforehand because I knew it would take so much time. <laughs> what are the eyes made of? Oh, yeah. So this is actually something new I learned. Um, the eyes are also leather, but they're wet formed like the spikes were. So I got it really wet and stapled it down over a glass cabochon, which is like a squashed marble. But I stretched it out over one of those and let it dry. And then when it came off, it was kind of like a dome shape. And then I hardened the leather in ammonia. So it's kind of like tough. It doesn't bend like this. And then it's shiny because we used shellac, which is just like a spray on lacquer that they have in the jewelry shop. But it looks super good in the end. I'm really proud of this one. It doesn't have a strap on it yet. because There were complications with like buckle sizes, <laughs> but it is a bag. And I hope to finish it once I get like the supplies to do. I'll use it always. I'm super proud of this. So, <laughs> uh, as I mentioned before, tooling. I am making my dad an arm guard for archery, and I already did some tooling on it. We, I just learned about this today. I did not know these existed. But so you can, when you get leather wet, it gets like more. Malleable, pliable, maybe. Yeah. So, what normally, how I did it was, you get it wet, and there's these stamps, and you hit them in with a hammer, and like it makes an indent. But I did not know these existed. They're these little plastic sheets with like ridges on them. So you get the leather wet, you put it down, and you take a burnisher, and you rub it in, and it's just there. Well, obviously, it doesn't look like this. I took the swivel knife. And I cut around all these patterns and emphasize them using more tooling. That's why I look like this. And now I'm just going to do stamps on it, which I think is like the most basic form of tooling in my opinion. Just because like the designs were already made, it's like quick, you know, put this back in the protective sleeve. Come on. Okay. So when you do tooling, like I said, you get it wet. And we have these fancy spray bottles that I love. So you get it wet. And I'm going to do more of this Celtic stuff. We have a lot of stamps. These are just a few of them. But this is like a small version of the knots. And it probably will be like somewhat loud. You put it on this granite slab so there's less bounce back. The thing with tooling is you can only hit it once. Otherwise, you will get, like, echoes of the shape, and it'll look messy. So when you hit it on a rubber sheet or just a table, maybe, like, you're more likely to get echoes because about bouncing the surfaces but on a granite slab, 
there's no bounce. It's also way quieter. <laughs> and woof, that one was crooked. I'll try and try and correct that. <laughs> I usually have a ruler, but I'm just gonna try and that looks better. And then after you do tooling, when you dye it, the dye gets like stuck in the little ridges and it looks super cool. Oh man. Little corner, that's a little weird. Oh well. Where did this come out of? There it is. So this is a piece for your dad? Yes, it's an arm guard. So the leather here is pretty rough. So we have like softer leather at home that I'm gonna cut out like a little sleep cord that goes into the hand. But basically when you put laces in here, it'll just go like that. His arm's way bigger than mine, but <laughs> you can kind of see what's going on. And I have leather paint at home, so I will paint it there, but yeah, the arm guard's a pretty simple thing. I mean, it's like one piece compared to however many pieces I cut out for that thing. Yeah, I have like calluses on my fingers now because of it. But oh, work yeah. paid off with that beautiful fish yeah. bag. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Lauren. What a pleasure to get to see a retrospective of some of your pieces, your current work. And a demo on how to make a beautiful arm guard for archery, right? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Let's give a big brava for Lauren Bartlett, second year Fuego. Thank you, Lauren. Hey everyone, hope that you enjoyed our uh, Fuego presentations from this summer. Um, they were such an incredibly talented group of teens uh, and artists in their own right. Um, I'm here to answer any questions that you might have about our Fuego program or about the Crucible. So the age range for Fuego leaders is 15 to 18. Um, Fuego leaders at the Crucible come and take classes with us. A lot of them are introduced to the Crucible by joining a field trip uh, through their school at first. Um, and then they take classes here at the Crucible. We also have a scholarship program um, for students to ensure that there are no barriers to arts access. Uh, and then starting when they're about a sophomore or junior in high school, they can apply for an interview to become one of our Fuego leaders. Uh, it is a two-year program. Um, this past summer, we only had our second year Fuego's return because of all the complications and challenges of doing youth programming in a, a COVID international pandemic. Um, we uh, decided to do a smaller group of our second year Fuegos who are already familiar with our um, working operations. Uh, and so next year we're going to do an expanded program again for new year for new first year Fuegos. Uh, so Fuegos are required to have taken at least three classes with us here at the Crucible. There's an application and an interview process, um, as well as a, a little letter of reference from a teacher or one of their instructors here or a friend um, who's seen their creative work. Um, and then we, we welcome anywhere from seven to 15 Fuegos per year. Um, it is a non-paid program. Um, we actually pay a stipend to our Fuego team leaders. Um, so they are compensated for joining our program um, over the summer. Um, our Fuego program um, is 11 years old now. Um, so we've been having Fuego leaders come through our programs for many, many years. Um, some of our earliest Fuego leaders are actually part of our staff and faculty here at the Crucible now, which is awesome, um, having them become part of our, our um, organization. 
Um, we have tons of classes for all different age groups. Um, all of the areas that you saw demoed for the Fuego leaders, we have adult and youth classes. So glass flame working, blacksmithing, arc welding, jewelry making, and leatherworking. We have youth and adult classes as well as private workshops. Oh, um, our classes are paid. We have different um, fees for our classes, but we do have a scholarship program that we um, are trying to keep active even in this uh, global pandemic time. What's my favorite class? Um, I really like doing the jewelry metal clay classes. So the area that Leslie was in, um, there's this uh, part of jewelry and metal smithing called metal clay. It actually takes like silver or copper or gold metal and it um, mixes it with like some inert ingredients and liquid to make it almost like a, um, uh, almost like a paste that can be molded into different shapes and then um, hard fired or torch fired um, so that it becomes a solid piece um, and the inner ingredients burn out. It's really cool. You can make all sorts of different shapes. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, I'm the director of programs here at Percival. Uh, I'm uh, two years into this role. So my um, role is to support all of our classes, faculty and program staff. Um, so our department includes all of our adult classes, youth classes, uh, team builds and private workshops for youth and adults, uh, large scale and small scale community events, volunteers um, and uh, external engagement, things like these programs. I get to work with an incredible team of um, dedicated educators and administrators every day. Bijou with the questions. All right, I feel like I'm on the Spitfire or something. <laughs> so the Crucible was founded in 1999. Uh, in Berkeley, actually. Um, so we're celebrating our 21st year um, of programming. Um, the first building was actually over in Berkeley and it was a much smaller building. Um, the building that we're in right now that probably a lot of people are used to over on 7th Street in West Oakland is a 56,000 square foot industrial arts education warehouse. Um, we are on Chichonia land um, and uh, way, way back, um, during the Industrial Revolution, um, there were train tracks that were laid coming off from the ports. Um, so the, the train tracks still exist in this building was made to become a train maintenance yard. Um, so trains would roll off from the ports into this building, get maintained and then roll back out. Um, in the 80s and 90s, this was a Sonos tube factory. So cardboard tubes, like giant cardboard tubes would get filled with concrete to make columns um, that then went all over the country for columns. Um, and then in 2003, then Governor Jerry Brown helped the Crucible acquire this building to make the move over from the smaller building in Berkeley to this much larger building. Um, when the Crucible moved here, um, all that was part of this building was the concrete floor, the roof, which has since been replaced. I'll give you a little up view of the roof. And then these brown metal kind of support uh, beams, everything else was built by staff and volunteers um, completely from scratch. All the classrooms, all the studios, all the different uh, department areas, the event space, everything was built um, by Crucible folks. Oh, Bijou, good job, bring us on home. Um, so our website is thecrucible.org. Uh, at thecrucible.org, one can see all the different classes that we have going on, our events, um, and see different ways to support the Crucible. Um, donations are always great, but there's lots of ways to contribute to the incredible work that the Crucible does across the community and for all ages. We have a volunteer program. Um, it's great to be able to welcome uh, creative artists and entrepreneurs um, at no cost. We wanna be able to support making and creating here in Oakland and the greater Bay Area.
Um, so definitely check out the crucible.org to see ways that you can come take a class like you saw our Fuego's demoing or support us in the different things that we do across the Bay Area. <laughs> that was a lot of questions, Miju. Good job. Um, I'm happy to, to answer any other questions. Um, I guess the, you know, the, the things that I think are uh, always important to remember is the crucible isn't anything without all of you. Um, the crucible is the place that it is. It is the creative space that it is because of the people who walk through the, through the doors um, and bring their creativity, their history, their stories um, into the classroom and into their art. Um, and so that's what's so important about our space. The fabric of our organization is the, are the stories of the people who make it. Um, so we hope that you'll come and check us out and join us and, and be a creative maker yourself. We've got some classes going on right now. We've got these things called tasters um, that are short form introductory classes. So we have a handful of classes going on right now in jewelry, arc welding, um, like what Elisa was demoing earlier, um, glass fusing and slumping, uh, which is kind of like collaging with glass. Um, there's a ceramics class and a foundry bell making class going on. Um, and then in a little bit, we've got some blacksmithing uh, starting up leather working um, and MIG welding, which is another one of our MIG, uh, another one of our welding areas. Um, we offer mostly classes on weekends and evenings. Um, we've changed our hours a little bit just based on um, the frequency at which people are joining us. Um, and so that we can make sure that our staff have um, breaks. Um, but yeah. All right. Thank you everyone for joining the Crucible session as part of Life is Living 2020. Um, amazing job, all the people who've helped to make this session happen. Thank you so much to our interpreter, MJ. A big thanks to Joan and Bijou who've been super helpful to us uh, in helping to make sure that the Crucible gets to participate. Um, and to everyone who's been helping to make Life is Living possible this year, great great job. Um, thanks all. Be well, and we'll see you live and in person here at the Crucible and at Life is Living next year. <laughs>